Sire, I don't remember when I first noticed him looking at me, Sire, but I knew he was looking every time, all the time I walked past his house. Then him and his friends were sitting on their bikes in front of the house, pitching pennies. They didn't scare me. They did, but I wouldn't let them know. I don't cross the street like other girls. Straight ahead, straight eyes, walk past. I knew he was looking. I had to prove to me that I wasn't scared of nobody's eyes, not even his. I had to look back hard just once like he was glass, and I did. I did once, but I looked too long when he rode his bike past me. I looked because I wanted to be brave, straight into the dusty cat fur of his eyes, and the bike stopped and he bumped into a parked car, bumped him, I walked fast. It made your blood freeze to have somebody look at you like that. Somebody looked at me. Somebody looked. His kind, his ways. He's a punk, Papa says. And Mama says not to talk to him. And then his girlfriend came. Lois, I heard him call her. She's tiny and pretty and smells like baby skin. I see her sometimes running to the store for him. And once she, when she was standing next to me at Mr. Benny's grocery, she was barefoot. I saw her barefoot baby toenails all painted pale, pale pink, like little pink seashells, and she smells like, smells pink, but like babies do. She's got big girl hands, and her bones are like ladies' bones, and she wears makeup too, but she doesn't know how to tie her shoes. I do. Sometimes I hear them laughing late, beer cans and cats and the trees talking to themselves. Wait, wait, wait. Sarah lets Lois ride his bike around the block or they take walks together. He, she holds his hand and he stops sometimes to tie her shoes. But Mama says those kinds of girls, those girls are, are the ones that go into alleys. Lois who can't tie her shoes. Where does he take her? Everything is holding its breath inside me. Everything is waiting to explode like Christmas. I want to be all new and shiny. I want to sit out bad at night. The boy around my neck and the wind under my skirt. Not this way. Every evening, talking to the trees, leaning out my window, imagining what I can't see. The boy held me once so hard, I swear. I felt the great grip and weight of his arms, but it was a dream. Sire, how did you hold her? Was it like this? And when he kissed her, like this? Or skinny trees. They're the only ones who understand me. I'm the only one who understands them. Poor skinny trees with skinny necks and pointy elbows like mine. For who do not belong here but are here. For raggedy excuses planted by the city. From our room we can hear them but Nanny just sleeps and doesn't appreciate these things. Their strength is secret. They send ferocious roots beneath the ground. They grow up and grow down and grab the earth between their hairy toes and bite the sky with violent teeth and never quit the air, their anger. This is how they keep. Let one forget his reason for being. They all droop like tulips in the grass, each with their arms around each other. Keep, keep, keep. The trees say when I sleep, they teach. When I am too sad and too skinny to keep keeping, and when I am a tiny thing against so many bricks, it is then I look at the trees. There's nothing to look left to look at on the street, or who grew despite the concrete, or who reach and do not forget to reach, or whose only reason is to be and be. No speak English. Mama Sita is the big mama of the man across the street, third floor, floor front. Rachel says her name ought to be Mama Sota, but I think that's mean. The man saved his money to bring her here. He saved and saved because she was alone and the baby boy with the baby boy in that country. He worked two jobs. He came home late and he left early, every day. Then one day, Malcita and the baby boy arrived and he yelled a taxi. The taxi door opened like a waiter's arm. Out stepped the tiny pink shoe, a foot soft as a rabbit's ear, then the thick ankle, a flutter of hips, fuchsia roses and green perfume. The man had to pull her. The taxi cab driver had to push. Push, pull, push, pull. 
All at once she bloomed, a huge, enormous, beautiful to look at, from the salmon pink feather on the tip of her hat to the little rose buds of her toes. I couldn't take my eyes off her tiny shoes. Up, up, up the, the stairs she went with the baby boy in a blue blanket, the man carrying her suitcases, her lavender hat boxes, a dozen boxes of satin high heels. Then we didn't see her. Somebody said it's because she's too fat. Somebody because of the three flights of stairs. But I don't believe she doesn't come out because she's afraid to speak English. Maybe this is so since she only knows eight words. She knows to say, he not here, for when the landlord comes. No speaking English if anybody else comes. And holy smokes. I don't know where she learned this, but I heard her say it one time and it surprised me. My father says when he came to this country, he ate ham and eggs for three months. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Ham and eggs. That was the only word he knew. He doesn't eat ham and eggs anymore. Whatever her reason, whether she's fat or can't climb the stairs or is afraid of English, she won't come down. She sits all day by the window and plays a Spanish radio show and sings all the homesick songs about her country in a voice that sounds like a seagull. Home. Home. Home is a house in a photograph, a pink house, pink as holly locks with lots of startled light. The man paints the walls of the apartment pink, but it's not the same, you know. She still sighs for a pink house, and I think she cries. I would. Sometimes the man gets disgusted. He starts screaming and you can hear it all the way down the street. Aye, she says. She's not sad. Oh, he says, not again. Quando, 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 she asks. Ah, caray, we are home. This is our home. Here I am, and here I stay. Speak English, speak English, cry. Ay. Mamacita, who does not belong, every once in a while lets out a cry, a hysterical high, as if he had torn the only skinny thread that kept her alive, the only road out to that country. And then to break her heart forever, the baby boy, who had begun to talk, starts to sing the Pepsi commercial he heard on TV. No speak English, she says to the child who is singing in the language that sounds like tin. tin. No speak English, no speak English, and bubbles into tears. No, 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 as if she can't believe her ears. Rafaela, who drinks coconut and papaya juice t on Tuesdays. On Tuesdays, Rafael's husband comes home late because that's the night he plays dominoes. And then Rafaela, who's still young and getting, but getting old from leaning out the window so much, gets locked in indoors because her husband is afraid Rafaela will run away since she's too beautiful to look at. Rafaela leans out the window and leans on her elbow and dreams her hair is like Rapunzel's. On the corner, there is music from the bar and Raffaella wishes she could go there and dance before she gets old. A long time passes and we forget she's up there watching until she says, Kids, if I give you a dollar, will you go to the store and buy me something? She throws a, draw, throws a crumpled dollar down and out, always asks for coconut or sometimes papaya juice. When we send it up to her in a paper shopping bag, she lets down with a closed line. Rafaela, who drinks and drinks coconut and papaya juice on Tuesdays, wishes there were sweeter drinks, not bitter like an empty room, but sweet, sweet like the island, like the dance hall down the street where the women much older than her throw green keys easily like dice and open homes with keys. But there is someone offering sweeter drinks, someone promising to keep them on silver string. Sally. Sally is the girl with eyes like Egypt and nylons the color of smoke. The boys at school think she's beautiful because her hair is shiny black like raven feathers, and when she laughs, she flicks her hair back like a satin shawl over her shoulders and laughs. Her father says to be this beautiful is trouble. They are very strict in his religion. They are not supposed to dance. He remembers his sisters and is sad. And she can't go out. Sally, I mean. Sally, who taught you to paint your eyes like Cleopatra? And if I rolled a little brush with my tongue and 
chew it to a point and dip it in the muddy cake, the one with the little red box. Will you teach me? I like your black cloak, coat, and those shoes you wear. Where did you get them? My mother says to wear black so young is dangerous. But I want to buy shoes like yours, like your little black ones made out of suede, just like those. One day, when my mother's in a good mood, maybe after my next birthday, I'm gonna ask to buy the nylons too. Cheryl, who's not your friend anymore, not since last Tuesday before two Easter, and not since the day you made her, her ear bleed, and not since you called, she called you that name and bit a hole in your arm. And you looked as if you were going to cry and everyone was waiting and you didn't. You didn't, Sally. Not Since then, you don't have a best friend to lean against the schoolyard fence with, to laugh behind your hand. Is that what the boys say? There was no one to lend you her hairbrush. The boy stories the boys tell in the coat room, they're not true. You lean against the schoolyard fence alone with your eyes closed as if no one was watching, as if no one could see you standing there, Sally. What do you think about when you close your eyes like that? And why do you always have to go straight home after school? You become a different Sally. You pull her skirt straight, you rub the blue paint off your eyelids. You don't laugh, Sally. You look at your feet and walk fast to the house that you can't come out from. Sally, do you sometimes wish you didn't have to go home? Do you wish your feet would one day keep walking and take you far away from Mongo Street? Far away and maybe your feet would stop in front of a house? A nice one with flowers and big windows and steps for you to climb up two by two upstairs to where a room is waiting for you? And if you opened the little window latch and gave it a shove, the windows would swing open and all the sky would come in. There'd be no, no nosy neighbors watching, no motorcycles and cars, no sheets and towels and laundry. Only trees and more trees and plenty of blue skies. And you can laugh, Sally. You could go to sleep and wake up and never have to think about who likes and doesn't like you. You could close your eyes and you wouldn't have to worry about what people said because you never belonged here anyway and nobody could make you sad and nobody could, would think you're strange because you like to dream and dream. And no one could yell at you if they saw you out in the dark leaning against a car, leaning against somebody without someone thinking you were bad, without somebody saying it is wrong, without the whole world waiting for you to make a mistake when all you wanted, all you wanted Sally was to love and to love and to love and no one could call that crazy. Minerva writes poems. Minerva is only a little bit older than me, but already has two kids and a husband who left. Her mother raised her kids alone and looks like her daughters will go that way too. Minerva cries because her luck is unlucky. Every night and every day and prays. But when the kids are asleep and after she's fed them their pancake dinner, she writes poems on little pieces of paper that she folds over and over and holds in her hands a long time. Little pieces of paper that smell like a dime. She lets me read her poems, and I let her read mine. She was always sad like a house on fire. Always something wrong. She has many troubles, but the big one is her husband, who left and keeps leaving. One day, she's through and lets him know enough is enough. Out the door she glo he goes. Clothes, records, cl shoes, out the window and the door lock. But that night he comes back and sends a big rock through the window. Then he is sorry and she opens the door again. Same story. Next week she comes over black and blue and asks, what can she do? Minerva. I don't know which way she'll go. There's nothing I can do. Bums in the attic. I want a house on a hill like the ones with, with the gardens where Papa works. We go on Sundays, Papa's day off. I used to go. I don't go anymore. I don't like to go out with us, Papa says. Getting too old? Getting too stuck up, says Nanny. 
I don't tell them that I'm ashamed, all of us staring out the window looking like the hungry. I'm tired of looking at what we can't have. When we win the lottery, mama begins, and then I stop listening. People who live on the hills sleep so close to the stars that they forget those of us who live too much on earth. They don't look down except to be content to live on hills. They have nothing to do with last week's garbage or fear of rats. Night comes. Nothing wakes them but the wind. One day I'll own my own house, but I won't forget who I am or where I came from. Passing bums will ask, can I come in? And I'll offer them the attic, ask them to stay because I know how it is to be without a house. Some days after dinner, guests and I will sit in the front of a fire. Floorboards will squeak upstairs, the attic grumble. Rats, they ask. Bums, I'll say and I'll be happy. Beautiful and cruel. I am an ugly daughter. I'm the one nobody comes for. Nanny says she can't, won't wait her whole life for a husband to come and get her. That Minerva's sister left her mother's house by having a baby, but she doesn't want to go that way either. She wants things all her own, to pick and choose. Ninny has pretty eyes, and it's easy to talk that way if you are pretty. My mother says that when I get older, my dusty hair will settle and my blouse will learn to stay clean. But I will have decided not to grow up tame like the others who lay their necks on the threshold waiting for the ball and chain. In the movies, I was always the one with red lips who is beautiful and cruel. She's the one who drives the men crazy and laughs them all away. Her power is all her own. She will not give it away. I have begun my own quiet war. Simple, sure. I am the one who leaves the table like a man without putting it back the chair or picking up the plate. A smart cookie. I convinced somebody, you know, another says inside. She lived the sit in the city her whole life. She can speak two languages. She can sing an opera. She knows how to fix a TV. But she doesn't know which way, which subway train to take to get downtown. Or hold her hand very tight while we wait for the right train to arrive. She used to draw when she had time. Now she draws with a needle and thread, little knotted rosebuds, tulips made of silk thread. Someday she would like to go to the ballet. Someday she would like to go see a play. She borrows, borrows opera records from the public library and sings with velvety lungs, powerful as Morning glories. Today, while cooking oatmeal, she's mad and butterfly until she sighs and points the wooden spoon at me. You could have been somebody, you know. That's where I'm at. You go to school, study hard. That man and butterfly was a fool. She stirs the oat oatmeal. Look at my comadres. She says, Isaura, who whose husband left, and Yolanda, whose husband is dead. Got to take care of all your own, she says, shaking her head. Then I'll ignore. Shame is a bad thing, you know. It keeps you down. You want to know why I quit school? Because I didn't have nice clothes. No clothes, but I had brains. Yep. She says, disgusted, stirring again. I was a smart cookie back then. What Sally said. He never hits me hard. She says, she said where her mama rubs hard on all the places where it hurts. Then at school she'd say she fell. That's where all the blue places came from. That's why her skin is always scarred. Who believes her? A girl that big? A girl who comes in with her pretty face all beaten and black can't be falling off the stairs. He never hits me hard. But Sally doesn't tell about the time he hit her with his hands like just like a dog, she said. Like if I was an animal. He thinks I'm going to run away like his sisters who made the family ashamed. Just because I'm a daughter. She doesn't say. 
So I was going to get permission to stay with us a little and one two Thursday she fi came finally with a sack full of clothes and a paper bag of sweet bread her mama sent. And would have stayed too except when the dark came her father, whose eyes w were little from crying, knocked on the door and said, Please come back. This is the last time. And she said, Daddy, and went home. Then we didn't need to worry, until one day Sally's father catches her talking to a boy, and the next day she doesn't come to school, and the next, until the way Sally tells it, he just went crazy. He just forgot he was her daughter, between the buckle and the belt. You're not my daughter. You're not my daughter. And then he broke into his hands. The monkey garden. The monkey doesn't live there anymore. The monkey moved to, to Kentucky and took his people with him. And I was glad because I didn't want to listen to his wild screaming at night. The twangy yakety yak of the people who owned him. The grain metal cage, the porcelain tabletop, and the family that spoke like guitars. Monkey family table, all gone. It was then we took over the garden we had been afraid to go into when the monkey screamed and showed its yellow teeth. There are flowers, and sunflowers as big as flowers on Mars, and thick coxcombs leading the deep red fringe of the theater to curtains. There were dizzy bees and bow-tied fruit flies turning summer salts and humming in the air. Sweet, sweet peach trees, thorn roses and thistle and pears. Leads like so many squinted stars, squinty-eyed stars and br brush that made your ankles itch and itch until you washed soap with soap and water. There are big green apples hard as knees and everywhere the sleepy smell of rotting wood, damp earth and dusty holly locks, thick and perfumey like the blue blonde hair of the dead. Yellow spires ran when we turned rocks over and pale worms, blind and afraid of the light, rolled over in their sleep. Poke a stick in the sandy soil and a few blue-skinned fields would appear, an avenue of ants and so many crusty ladybugs. There was a garden, a wonderful thing to look at in the spring. But bit by bit, after the monkey left, the garden began to take over itself. Flowers stopped obeying little bricks that kept them from growing behind their, growing beyond their paths. Weeds mixed in. Dead cars appeared overnight, like mushrooms. First one, then another, then a pale blue pickup with the front windshield missing. Before you knew it, the monkey garden became filled with sleepy cars. Things had a way of disappearing in the garden, as if the garden itself ate it as if with its old man memory, and put them away and forgot them. Nanny found a dollar and a dead mouse between two rocks in the stone wall where the morning glories climbed. Once again we were playing hide and seek. Eddie Vargas laid his head between beneath a hibiscus tree and fell asleep there like a Rip Van Winkle until somebody remembered he was in the game and went to look for him. This, I suppose, was the reason why we went here, far away from where our mothers could find us. We and a few old dogs who lived inside the empty cars. We made a clubhouse once on the back of our old blue pickup, and sometimes we liked to jump from the roof of one car to another and pretend we were, they were like giant mushrooms. Someone started the lie that the monkey garden had been there before anything. We'd like to think that the garden could hide things for a thousand years. There, beneath the roots of soggy flowers, were the bones of murdered pirates and dinosaurs, and the ivy in the ground turned to coal. This was where I wanted to die, and where I tried one day, not, but not even the monkey garden would have me. It was the last day I would go there. Who said that I was getting too old to play the games? I said, who was it I didn't listen to? All I remember when the others ran, I wanted to run too, up and down and through the monkey garden, faster than the boys, not like Sally, who screamed as it 
You know, she got her stockings muddy. I said, Sally, come on. But she wouldn't. She stayed by the curb, talking to Tito and his friend. Play with the kids if you want, she says. I'm, play I'm staying here. She could be stuck up like that if she wanted to, so I just left. It was her own fault, too. When I got back, Sally was pretending to be mad. Something about the boys having stolen her keys. Please give them back to me, she said, punching the nearest one with the soft fist. They were laughing, too. She was, too. It was a joke I didn't get. I want to go back with the other kids who were still jumping on cars, still chasing each other through the garden. But Sally had her own games. One of the boys invented the rules. One of Tito's friends said, You can't get the keys back unless you kiss us. Sally, and Sally pretended to be mad at first, but then she said yes. It was that simple. I don't know why, but something inside me wanted to throw a stick. Something wanted to say no, but... And when I watched Sally going into the garden with Tito's buddies all grinning, it was just a kiss, that's all. A kiss for each one, she said. So what? Only, how come I felt angry inside? Like something wasn't right. Sally went behind that blue pickup to kiss the boys and get her keys back. I ran up three flights of stairs to where Tito lived. Mother was ironing shirts and she was sprinkling water on them from an empty pop bottle and smoking a cigarette. Your son and his friends stole Sally's keys and now they won't give them back unless she kisses them right now and they're making her kiss them. I said all out of breath in the three flights of stairs. Those kids, she said, not looking up from her ironing. That's all? What do you want me to do? Call the cops? She said. He kept on ironing. I looked at her a long time, but didn't think of anything to say. I ran back down the three flights of stairs to the garden where Sally want needed to be saved. I took three. I took three big sticks and a brick and figured this was enough. I, but when I got there, Sally said, "Go home." Those boys said, "Leave us alone." I was stupid with my brick. They all looked at me as if I was the one that was crazy and made me feel ashamed. And I don't know why, but I had to run away. I had to hide myself at the other end of the garden, in the jungle part under a tree that wouldn't mind if I lay down and cried a long time. I closed my eyes like tight stars so that I wouldn't, but I did. My face felt hot. Everything inside hiccuped. I heard somewhere in India that there are priests who give will their heart to stop beating. I wanted to will my blood to stop, my heart to quit its pumping. I wanted to be dead, to turn into the rain, my eyes melt into the ground like two black snails. I wished and wished, closed my eyes and willed it. But when I got up, my dress was gray and I had a headache. I looked at my feet in their white socks and ugly round shoes. They seemed so far away. They didn't seem to be my feet anymore. And the garden that had been such a good place to play didn't seem like mine anymore. Red clouds. Sally, you lied. It wasn't what you said at all, what he did, or he touched me. I didn't want it, Sally. The way they said it, the way it's supposed to be, all the storybooks and movies. Why did you lie to me? I was waiting by the right clouds. I was standing by the tilt the world where you, where you said, and now I don't like carnivals. I want to be with you because you laugh on the tilt of world, throw your head back and laugh. I hold your chain, wave, count how many times you go by. Those boys that will look at you because you're pretty. I like to be with you, Sally. You're my friend. That big boy, 
Where did he take you? Waited such a long time. I waited by the right clouds, just like you said, but you never came. You never came for me. Sally, Sally, a hundred times, why didn't you hear me when I called? Why didn't you tell them to leave me alone? The one who grabbed me by the arm? He said he wouldn't let me go. He said, I love you, Spanish girl. I love you. He pressed his sour mouth to mine. Sally, make him stop. I couldn't make him go away. I couldn't do anything but cry. You don't remember. It was dark. I don't remember. I don't remember. Please don't. Leave me alone. I've waited my whole life. You're a liar. They all lied. All the books and magazines and everything that told it wrong. Only the dirty fingernails against my skin and only the sour mouth again. The moon that watched the tilt world of red clowns laughing their thick tongue laugh. <laughs> then the cloud colors began to whirl. The sky tipped. High black tune shoes ran. Sally? You lied. You lied. You wouldn't let me go. He said, Love you. Love you, Spanish girl. When all the Liam roses. Sally got married like we knew she would. Young and not married, but ready, but married just the same. She met a marshmallow salesman at school bazaar, and she married him in another city where it's legal to get married before eighth grade. She has her husband in her house now, her pillowcases and her plates. She says she's in love, but I think she did it to escape. Sally says she likes being married now because she gets to buy her own things and her husband gives her money. She's happy, except sometimes her husband gets angry and once he broke the door where his foot went through. Though, those days he's okay. Except, he won't let her talk on the telephone. And he doesn't look her, let her look out the window. And he doesn't like her friends, so nobody gets to visit her unless he's working. She sits at home because she's afraid to go outside without the permission. She looks at all the things they own, the towels and the toaster, the alarm clock and the drapes. She likes looking at the walls, at how neatly their corners meet, like linoleum roses on the floor, the ceiling smooth as a wedding cake. The Three Sisters it came with the wind that blows in August, thin as a spider web and barely noticed. Her who did not seem to be related to anything but the moon, one with laughter like tin, and one with the eyes of a cat, and one with hands like porcelain. The aunts, the three sisters, las comadres, they said. The baby died, Lucy and Rachel's sister. One night a dog cried, and the next day a yellow, blue, yellow bird flew in through an open window. Before the week was over, the baby's fever was worse. Then Jesus came and took the baby with him far away. That's what their mother said. Then the visitors came, in and out of the little house. It was hard to keep the floors clean. Anybody who had it who had ever wondered what color the walls were, came in to look at the little thumb of a human in a box like candy. I had never seen the dead before. Not for real. Not in someone's living room for people to kiss and bless themselves and light a candle for. Not in a house. It seemed strange. I must have known, the sisters. They had the power and could sense what was what. They said, "Come here, and give me a stick of give me a stick of gum." It smelled like Kleenex or the inside of a satin handbag. 
And then I didn't feel afraid. What's your name? The cat-eyed one asked. Speranza, I said. Speranza, the old blue-veined one repeated in a high, thin voice. Speranza, a good name. My knees hurt. The one with the funny laugh complained. Tomorrow it will rain. Yes, tomorrow, they said. How do you know? I asked. You know. Look at her hands, the cat-eyed one said. They turned them over and over as if they were looking for something. She's special. Yes, she'll go very far. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Make a wish. A wish? Yes, make a wish. What do you want? Anything? Well, why not? Close my eyes. Did you wish already? Yes, I said. Well, that's all there is to it. It will come true. How do you know? I asked. You know, we know. Esperanza. The ones with the marble hands called me aside. Esperanza. She held my face with her blue veined hands and looked at me. Long silence. When you leave, you must remember always to come back, she said. What? When you leave, you must remember to come back for the others. It's a circle, you understand? You must always be Esperanza. You will always be Mongol Street. You can't erase what you know. You can't forget who you are. And I didn't know what to say. It was as if she could read my mind. As if she knew what I wished for. And I felt ashamed for having made such a selfish wish. You must remember to come back. But the ones who could not leave as easily as you. Do you remember? She asked as if she was telling me. Yes. Yes, I said, a little confused. Good, she said, rubbing my hands. Good, that's all, you can go. I got up to join Lucy and Rachel, who were already outside, waiting by the door, wondering what I was doing, talking to three old ladies who smelled like cinnamon. I didn't understand everything they had told me. I turned around. They smiled and waved in their smoky way. Then I didn't see them, not once or twice or ever again. Alicia and I talking on Edna's steps. I like, I like Alicia because she once gave me a little leather purse with the word Guadalajara stitched in it, which is home for Alicia. I wonder if she will go back there. But today she's listening to my sadness because I don't have a house. You live right here, 14, 4006 Mongo, Alicia says and points to the house in the shingle. No, this is my house, I say and shake my head as if shaking it could undo the year I've lived there. I don't belong. I don't ever want to come from here. You have a home, Alicia. One day you'll go there to a town you remember. But me, I've never had a house, not even a photograph. The only one I dream of. No, Alicia says. Like it or not, you're Mongo Street. One day you'll come back to. Not me. Not until somebody makes them better. Who's gonna do it? The mayor? And the thought of the mayor coming to Mongo Street makes you laugh out loud. <laughs> Who's going to do it? Not the mayor. A house of my own, not a flat, not an apartment in back, not a man's house, not a daddy's, a house of my own, with my porch and my pillow, my little, my pretty purple petunias, my books and stars, two shoes waiting beside the bed, nobody to shake a stick at, nobody's garbage to pick up after, only a house quiet as snow, the space for myself to go, clean as paper before the poem. 
Mongo says goodbye sometimes. I like to tell stories. I tell them inside my head. I tell them after the mailman says, here's your mail, here's your mail, he said. I make a story for my life. One for each step my brown shoe takes. I say, and so she trudged up the wooden stairs, her sad brown shoes taking her to the house well she never liked. I like to tell stories. I'm going to tell you a story about a girl who didn't want to belong. We didn't always live on Mongo Street. Before that, we lived on Loomis on the third floor. Before that, we lived on Keeler. And before Keeler was Paulina. But what I couldn't remember for most is Mongo Street. The sad red house, the house I belong to but do not belong to. I put so much, I put it down on paper, and then the ghost does not ache so much. I write it down and Mongo says goodbye sometimes. She does not hold me with both arms. She sets me free. One day I will pack my bags of books and paper. One day I will say goodbye to Mongo. I'm too strong for her to keep me here forever. One day I will go away. Friends and neighbors will say, What happened to that Esperanza? Where did she go with all those books and paper? Why did she march so far away? They will not know I have gone away to to come back for the ones I left behind, for the ones who cannot out. And that's all she wrote.